afternoon and good evening to all of you joining us today from different parts of the world. And welcome to this important discussion on ESG, environmental, social and governance, where we will be assessing the progress and the challenges of integrating ESG in Africa. Now, this webinar is organized by the Women in Finance and Investment Network, WIFIN for short, and my name is Dikshita, and I will be the moderator for today's webinar to ensure that we have a fruitful and insightful discussion on this topic. Now, before we continue, let us just wait a few minutes to allow most of our participants to join us. And for those unable to join us today, please do know that this recording, the recording of this webinar will be made available in the coming days on our WIFIN website. So do check it out. And to our audience, please, you can always refer there, uh, check it out for any further reference and all. So um, just a few minutes, let's just wait for most of our attendees to join and we will resume the webinar shortly. Thank you. Thank you for waiting. Um, we are now about to kickstart our webinar of today. So once again, please allow me to extend my greetings to you all and welcome to today's discussion on assessing the integration of ESG in Africa. We are excited to have you all here with us. And as introduced earlier, I am Dikshita and shall be your moderator for this webinar, organized by the Women in Finance and Investment Network, along with our partners, the CGI Institute, Chartered Global Investment Analyst, and ICCE, Institute of Certified Chartered Economist. Now, before we jump to the subject of MATA, which is ESG in Africa, please allow me to give you a breakdown of today's session. I would want to begin by giving you a brief introduction for about Women in Finance and Investment Network, especially for those who are new to WFN. And then I will introduce to you our facilitator of today's webinar. And the facilitator will then take over to discuss the topic of today. And prior to ending the webinar, we will have a Q&A session. So let me quickly share my screen. Okay, so as we can see here, uh, Women in Finance and Investment Network. And today we're gonna discuss about, um, about WIFIN and what we stand for, um, the WIFIN global team, membership overview, membership benefits, and also who can join the network and how to join, definitely. So um, WIFIN is a non-profit membership-based organization committed to taking actions to bridge the generational gap in the finance and investment space. Now, it is known globally that there is an underrepresentation of women in the finance, investment, insurance, fintech, and the list goes on. And at WIFIN, we aim to address this underrepresentation with a global network of women in the finance and investment space, aiming at empowering women at every stage of their professional career. We strongly believe that with an increased visibility of today's female professionals, it will motivate the next generation of talent to aspire to these roles. And therefore, able to have a strong interconnectivity in the finance ecosystem. Now, 
WIFIN exists to give women the opportunity to receive the highest level of professional education, build credibility, tap into a global network to pursue a rewarding career in finance and investment management industry. We aim to achieve this through a series of dialogues, networking sessions, webinars like this one, meetups, summits, as well as through special programs together with our partners. As written in bold here, our vision is to accelerate the growth and to raise women leaders in the finance and investment space globally, while our commitment is to empower these women to successfully achieve their professional potential at each and every stage of their careers. Within, we stand for diversity by building trusting, open, and inclusive environment that treats each member in a manner that reflects our unique ways of raising professional women for higher roles in finance and investment. Synergy, as we are committed to connecting women at various levels of leadership in the industry. And lastly, opportunity, because we believe that our collective effort as an organization will become a catalyst for a transformed finance and investment industry in the future. Here, as you can see, is our global team, a group of dedicated young women in the finance and investment space, believing in creating impact by becoming a complementary voice to amplify and broaden the conversations around diversity and inclusion. Now, very quickly, membership. So, Within membership implies to join this global network that supports the development and career ambition as a member. Now, there are various benefits of becoming a Within member, such as through a global network, members get the opportunity to network with professionals from other global institutions around the world on a single platform. Also at WIFIN, we are seeking to partner with organizations to create internships and full-time job opportunities for our members to benefit with, from, sorry. In line with our action and mission as well, WIFIN in partnership with the CGI Institute has introduced a merit-based scholarship schemes for all its members around the world. The scholarship is offered both in full and partial, for our members who wish to enroll in the charter program. Within also facilitates regular workshop and capacity build building programs for our members across all levels to enable them to build career ambitions and develop relevant skills needed to succeed in the industry. We also have well-structured programs, both virtual and physical, to engage our members throughout the year to enhance their professional capacities of members, to network at various gatherings at chapter, regional, and global levels. And also, um, members also get access to newsletters on current trends happening in the finance and investment banking industry around the globe. We also do regular interviews with successful women in the industry who shares with us their expertise, insights, and, and journeys. And these are all made available to our members. So who can join? Of course, a woman. If you are a university student or recent graduate, or a woman who has already started her career in the finance and investment space, you are welcome to join us. There is an annual subscription fee for various categories and more information about these will be, is available on the website. Now we also have institutional partners that can join us, those who are champions of diversity and share deeply in our common vision. Again, more information is available on our website. So how to join, right? <laughs> All you got to do is visit the, the WIFIN website at www.wifinglobal.org and fill in the membership application form and follow the steps. Our team will be available to assist you if you face any difficulties in doing so. Well, this is it about the Women in Finance and Investment Network. 
So yes, thank you very much for giving me this audience and listening as I did the presentation about WFN. So if any of you are interested in joining Women in Finance and Investment Network, or if you have any questions about it, please do use the Q&A button and we are ever ready to provide you with the assistance you may need. Okay, now to the topic of the day, which you all are, are, are waiting for. ESG, environmental, social, and governance, where we are coming together to assess the, pro the progress and the challenges of integrating ESG in the African continent. Now see, in the past, institutional investors primary focus or objective and the trust in and the investors companies primary obligation was to maximize short term returns for shareholders without much regard of other factors like social and environmental impacts. Now, fast forward to today, there is a massive adoption of ESG criteria by companies seeking to attract investors. And thanks to the rise of the responsible investment movements, now we have an increasing number of investor firms allocating funds based on ESG considerations. Now we find that embracing ESG practices within an organization offers a wealth of benefits. So like for example, it improves productivity, business performance, adaptability to evolving technologies and so on and so on. Not, it's, 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 it's surprising to say that ESG has gained much popularity, mainly in the US and EU markets. While the African market is ripe and shows potential for ESG adoption, public data shows that Africa still has a long way to go in terms of managing resources sustainably, Develop it, developing management models that recognize the value of all members of the workforce and developing business models that keep Africans accountable to their principles as well as to their communities. So definitely, we see that the African continent deserves all our ESG attention because we need to see Africa not as a resource pool, but rather as an engine for the global transition that we need. And so today, we are very excited to have our ESG expert, Vaham Wilihangwi Manavela, who is the partner and head of ESG at iQualitas Capital, based in South Africa, to do us a presentation to give us insights about the progress and the challenges of integrating ESG in Africa. Hangwe, our distinguished guest of today, she has over 20 years of experience in ESG and social impact across Africa. She works with asset managers, companies, and development organizations to integrate ESG, drive compliance, provide training, and capacity building in ESG. She established and run ESG and impact at Africa's largest asset manager, the PIC, across its diversified investment portfolio. She has also served on advisory committees of the Principles of Responsible Investment, the PRI, the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, and the CFA Institute. Hungry regularly speaks on ESG panels at conferences globally. She's an Ethan Hover Fellow and also a Global Advisory Member of the Women in Finance and Investment Network's Global Advisory Board. So Hungry. Warm welcome to you and thank you so much for the opportunity of hosting you on Women in Finance and Investment Network platform. Oh, I think you it's mute. You have to unmute. I think now you can hear me. Yes, thank very, you very well. Much and thanks everyone for attending this webinar. And thanks for the invitation from Women in Finance. It's a really an honor for me to be part of this today. And as um, let me just try share my screen. Okay, quickly before before we start, I would like to also tell our audience that 
We will have a Q&A session after the presentation. So any question or queries that you have, please jot them down and they can be answered after the Q&A. Okay, so Hungui, the floor is all yours. You may take over and share with us your insights. Um, thank you very much. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, yes, it's very okay. clear. All right, thank you very much. And uh, as I said, uh, thank you for inviting me today. Uh, I've, as, as she asked me to say, we really need to have a webinar on ESG. I thought as a continent, I think it's time that we have this conversation where we now start thinking, where are we really going when it comes to ESG and how far have we gone? Where are we and to what is it that we really need to do? But as part of this presentation, I've also looked at other region to say what have they done and what is it that we can learn from them. So the, the, the first part, obviously, I really want to share with you Equalitas so that at least you understand what is Equalitas. Where do I really come from? Equalitas is still a, a new baby in the continent. We started, we opened our door last year in March. So we kind of like started operating during COVID. I always joke to say, I, we don't even know how to run a business without COVID. So the only time we have run a business is when there's COVID. So what we do, we offer advisory service in impact investment and environmental social and governance, which is ESG. And in terms of our in organization that seek to deploy capital or receive capital for growth and impact. That's our main thing. We really advise, and we have done it in within the LP and the GP, and we have identified the gaps. And we thought that would be a good opportunity for us now to say, go service other people so that at least they understand exactly how to integrate ESG within the investment process. So if you really have ESG needs, whether you are in an investor or an MVC company or a GP, those are the kind of market that we really service. So, and like I said, we offer impact investing where we look at the strategy, we look at operational integration, we look at impact narrative as well. We do business advisory and also thought leadership. That's the key thing that we really focus on. And in terms of ESG, we offer strategy. We do ESG integration, where we will really look at ESG from the immediately when you start thinking on investing until you exit the investment. That's the approach that we really take to say, how do we really help you as a fund manager or as an LP or as a company? to integrate ESG within all your decision making so that it becomes part of your day-to-day -day activity as well. We do training and capacity building, we do ESG audits, and obviously because we are also based in South Africa, transformation is one of the key things, knowing that South Africa is very much into transformation, which other areas are also adopting, and we have seen a number of them looking at it differently. We can look at it from indigenous people, we can look at it from the B as well, that's the approach we, we normally take. So we kind of like service the market, look at what exactly do you need. So then I thought I will have a number of audience as well. Maybe some of them might not even understand when I say ESG, what are the key thing that we are really looking at? I thought, let me just put a slide that really gives you an understanding to say what exactly are we talking about when we talk about ESG? Because, and there's a lot of, I think one thing that you should be clear, there's a lot of uh, jargons that will come today, abbreviation that sometimes we also forget what they mean, but we are so much used to saying those things to a point where now if you said, what does this mean? I'll stop and think, okay, how do I really put it? But uh, <clears throat> looking at ESG, obviously you are looking at the environmental aspect where you are making sure that you are looking at it from the investment point of view to make sure that whatever you do, you drive sustainability, you care for the environment. Investment doesn't really have to take preference over the environment or the social aspect or governance aspect. That's the key thing that we are really trying to drive. And obviously the key we put not in order of preference, but obviously the key thing that are addressed under environmental, it will be the issue around climate change, it's biodiversity issue, it's resource efficiency, it's a resource management as well, where we try to manage the resource. I think when you do the introduction, you mentioned something uh, something very critical to say Africa is lagging behind. We've got so many investors or so many people who come to Africa for our resource, but we don't even have anything that we've put that guide how people should really 
take our minerals or our resources. They just come mine it or take whatever it is. But when they bring back the money, they attach a lot of sustainability condition, which now we have to comply. So I think if we were really moving forward, we will have put those sustainability principles. So if you are mining in Africa, these are the things that you really need to, to look at it. And these are the things that we really want to look at it today to say, how do we really progress to a point where our continent will be able to have those principles? We have our own principle as much as other people have got their own principles as well. The other area that we look at it is air, water, and land pollution as well, which you know that water is a key for most of the investment that you will have. We look at issues around waste management. You look at issues around energy and water usage as well. So when we look at the S, we're looking at the labor and human rights issues within the company as well. We are lo looking at issues around freedom of association. Does the employee have that freedom of association? Are they given that? Can they really say what they want? Do they have freedom of speech or they can join the union without fear of being victimized within the company as well? We look at the employee, we look at community health and safety, we look at the life and fire safety as well in terms of the, if there's fire, are we able to save life? Because the most important thing obviously to save life, other assets can be injured, but the first thing that you really need to look at it is it's life. You look at all the thing around the exit as well, you look at issues around stakeholder engagement, supply chain management, where you are buying things, do they really follow the ESG principle at the same way you really want them to adhere to as well? And now there's a lot of thing around data privacy and security. Those are the things that we really look at it. And then when we look at governance, we'll be looking at issues around compliance with applicable local, local and national regulations. Those are the first point of departure. Whatever company you're investing in, do they really comply? Because if they don't, it means that the government can just close them anytime and then you lose your investment. We look at issues around internal controls and transparency. Do they really have internal policy that control how do, how do they, how they run business as well? And also you look at the issue around board, how the board has been structured. Is it independent from management? Can they make decision without being interfered with how management want to see things as well? You look at all issue around board committees, you know board committees, most of the, the countries that have got the Companies Act or regulation around the uh, companies, they will require you to have board committees. And they will also stipulate the requirement in terms of like what those board committees can do and what is it that they can't do as well. You look at issues around shareholder rights where you're looking at minority protection. If you're going there as a minority, are you really protected? And then you also look at the whole issue around the anti bribery corruption, money laundering as well. That long word is about money laundering and the, the Financial Act as well. So that's something that we always look at it, make sure that there are no issues that really that affect compliance as well. So those are the key ESG issues that we normally look at it when we are assessing ESG and when we talk about ESG. So I thought this will help in terms of like when we go to the discussion, you will have a clear understanding on exactly what are you, what are you talking about? Because sometimes I can go through the whole presentation and you don't really understand exactly what we're talking about. So now why, why ESG? Obviously we are looking at ESG, it's considered because obviously there are issues around materiality. What is material? And materiality is mainly looked at it from the, 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 the sector that you're operating in, the geographic area as well, those are the key things. What are key things for the sector? You, are, you can't look at the financial sector the same way as you look at the mining sector. They've got different materiality as well. Look at market demand, you look at regulations. I won't go through it. The numbers here, just outlining how ESG is gaining momentum and how investors are also moving towards ESG in terms of their, when they put their investment as well. And then, the, 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 then we started looking to say, let's understand why ESG and where does it come from? ESG can be tracked to the concept of responsible investing. It started a long time ago within the 18th century. Obviously there has been people who adopted it. It was voluntary. There was no requirement from any, anywhere in the world. People did it out of their own goodwill. And I think that's one principle that we always say, say, 
when you apply ESG, it's not about someone is watching. Do it when, do something good when no one is watching. That's why ESG, because normally you can, you can hide it. It might not be seen, but the long-term results will show when things go wrong. Obviously you can remember of all, almost many companies that have gone down after such a long time of hiding things, of not being transparent, of not disclosing things, then one day things go wrong and then everything fall, up, fall apart as well. But also the other thing, well, around the 1960s, obviously it was adopted, but it was mainly at adopting exclusion where the investors started excluding those stocks that maybe they've realized that they maybe they don't comply well with the moral of the society. And one target thing was the tobacco, some even exclude alcohol and drugs obviously has been excluded. So something that they call a sin industry as well has been excluded in most companies. And you remember that obviously if they are South African, also if you're not South African, most of the companies in South Africa were also excluded because of the apartheid where people were trying to push them to do the right thing and fight apartheid from the business because they were sponsoring some of those activities as well. So there were a number of South African companies that were, that were also excluded by those companies that adopted the principle of responsible and they felt that they couldn't really invest in companies that promote the apartheid regime as well. And then in 2005, the UNEPFI commissioned a report. The report was named Who Cares Win? And what they were looking at it was like looking at it from the, how do we really, they were looking at it to say, how can they really look at ENZ issue, ESG issues? Also looking in respect of the investors as well. So there, there, there were a number of recommendations that came from that report. And as a result, you will see that today we have got a UNPRI, which support international network investor signatories and also trying to make sure that there's that sense of stewardship and ownership within the investors, within the companies and, every, and across the industry as well. So those are the, the, some of the results that came from the, from the 2005 study that was commissioned. And obviously the whole principle of responsible investment, which now is a big movement, I will show you in terms of membership at a later stage, in terms of like, how is it really going? So Africa, we have got our own, our own office as well, where signatories within the continent can just join the PRI and get support straight from the, I think they, they do Africa and Middle East group together. The last time I checked, the person was based in South Africa, but I think she kind of like transiting as well. Then obviously there, there were also another, the European Stock Exchange and consequences South African JSC have paved way in terms of implementing ESC requirement as part of, uh, of the listing requirement. And when you look at JSC, JSC has started, it's like back in 1912, your 2012, sorry. Back in 2012, where they have adopted this, uh, at first it was a triple bottom line where they were like just looking at it from the social C CRI, social responsibility, but now they've adopted it as ESG. And when you really list within the JSC, you will be required to comply with certain sustainability principles that they have put together as well. Europe, I think, is something that uh, it has been there. It has been flourishing. They've been doing well when it comes to ESG as well. So looking at the, the last part that I really want to see, as it gained momentum, obviously majority of come. The, the investor seems to know what they want because they put those conditions on the investment mandate. But companies are still struggling to understand exactly what do they need to do and how can they, they drive the value of ESG as well. We can see a number of companies directly, they, don't, they still don't understand how exactly they should do it. So you can, they, they seem to have been left behind. And here in the continent, obviously, you see investors. And I think one thing that I've also, as I was researching, we also don't have many investors from the continent. And those that have, everyone is using IFC, we're using CDC, we're using something from Europe. We don't really have our own performance standard. We don't have our own ESG requirements that really align with our environment. And that's the other area where maybe that's why the companies are struggling because they look, the people who develop them, they develop it them to guide their investment, but they didn't really come out with something very strong and say, how can company 
adopt the ESG and do it. And it's something that is still lacking. Yes, there are material, but I don't think they're not widely available the same way as the investors. Like if I say IFC performance standard, everyone understand it and we can get it, Google it, you can get it very quickly. But that's why I'm saying sometimes with the company, they are still struggling to say, okay, fine. The material have been developed from the investor point of view, but not from the company point of view. Development the investors was telling them what they want. But the question is like, did they really say this works for us? I think that's where the challenge is still there with most of the companies. Then looking at the global, like I said, I've, I've done some comparison looking at the global market to say where other regions are in terms of ESG and what is it that they're doing. Europe for me, I think is still at a very advanced stage. They're doing very well. They've got a number of regulations that have been put together that really forces people to disclose and be transparent and report on their ESG performance. It's a mandatory requirement. It's no longer a voluntary standard, something that they really need to do. And I think you might have heard about some of these things. Obviously, there's a sustainable finance action plan, which is published in 2018. This one requires financial disclosure also significance yeah, that they need to report on their ESG investment as well in terms of how are they doing it, how are they performing, what are some of the challenges they have experienced as well. Then we have also the corporate sustainable reporting directives that require larger companies to publish regular reports on the social and environmental impacts of their activities as well. So this report needs to be public and everyone needs to have access to it as well. And then you look at the European Union markets and financial regulations, where obviously it was done in 2017, still the same thing, asking investors that uh, ensure that investors' ESG preference are taken into consideration during investment. So if they have got a mandate, some of their mandate need to include ESG, and that need to be considered by both the advisors and the portfolio manage in portfolio management as well. The EU taxonomy, I think for people who are following this thing, it has come out recently. Last year, there's been a lot of uh, discussion around the EU taxonomy as well. And obviously I think it's also looking, this one is looking at both ESG and impact, but obviously focus more on the issue around the um, environmental sustainability as well. So those are the things that are in place. And when you look at other key drivers that are happening, there's also sustainable fund, voluntary sustainable fund levels where you can see that some country have adopted them. It's not really globally adopted because it's voluntary, but there are a number of companies that have already adopted and are applying them as well. And also the financial data exchange templates, which is something that they are working on it, is something that we hope that it will be released in 2022, which is next year. So you can, like I said, you can see that there, there are a lot of development and they're taking ESG seriously as well. And I think the other thing that they put is the Net Zero Assets Owner Alliance, where they're really trying to work hard it's a, to, in terms of meeting some of the Paris Agreement in terms of the, the climate change. And I think they, they are working around the 1.5 scenario, 1.5 uh, scenario as well, which is a very low. If they can achieve that, obviously in terms of climate change, they will have achieved a lot. The looking at the US market, obviously, as part of my, I think as part of my introduction, it was mentioned that I've done the I was, I'm an Eisenhower fellow. And one of my topic was to look at uh, how the US market is doing when it comes to ESG integration. Most of the thing are still at a voluntary disclosure basis. They kind of like not regulated a lot. So they are not really at an advanced stage as Europe, but the, you can see that currently from last year, this year, there's, num there's been a number of um, initiatives that have been moving in terms of making sure that number of ESG related aspects have been regulated. There's the Department of Labor, which are also looking at uh, enforcing some of the ESG factors in retirement option, making sure that uh, there are yeah, the sustainability issue, the environmental and governance issues are considered. That might also affect a lot of pension funds as well. There's also 
the, the other thing that is really happening as well within the US is the, okay, sorry, is the bill that is done by the Senate, which also look at um, ESG criteria that should be considered as well in terms of like all the government's retirement plan that I think when it happened, it will really affect. There are pension funds that are voluntarily doing and especially the big pension fund as well. But like I said, it's mainly voluntarily as well. So there are a number of initiatives. You can see that they're trying to pace, they're trying to move faster to make sure that they, they kind of like uh, get closer to what the Europeans are doing as well. And looking at uh, the other aspect, I think it's looking at the, the Canada as well. I chose this one. There are a number of other areas that I didn't really choose because I was looking at where who normally invest in Africa. And normally when they bring their money in Africa, they bring it with the condition that comes from their country. So it's always good for us to understand this condition because they will be imposed to us. You can see with Europe, whenever you receive the money from Europe, you have now, now they're even asking you to, to report on climate change. We don't even have any regulation when it comes to climate change in most of our countries but they want us to start reporting. So, and we don't even, sometimes we don't even know where to start. We just have to go and scratch the surface to find information from Europe and then try and adapt it here as well. So looking at Canada as well, Canada, obviously, I think they're also looking at different uh, states. They are not regulated as well, but there are other states, Ontario Pension Benefit Act. I think that's the first one that came up with the, with an investment statement in terms of ESG factors and making sure that ESG is integrated. But also you can see that the, the, the Quebec is also coming. There's also the legislation that are coming in Canada that are focusing on modern day slavery. They are focusing on net zero emission as well, accountability and right of indigenous people. So you could see that they are also trying to pace up in terms of ESG issues and making sure that there are regulations that address the challenges that they have so that ESG can be integrated as well. But now let's look at, uh, at our continent. What is it that we've done? And where are we when it comes to ESG? I have been looking. And the challenge that we have in our continent, you can see I was talking Europe, I was talking uh, US market, uh, Asia as well, you say that they've got something else that is more kind of like regional. But when you look at Africa, it's more every man for himself. You, every country is doing their own things. Yes, there, there might be a lot of learning and I think the Africa trade might also, with Af Africa trade coming into effect now, we might start seeing a lot of collaborative effective effect in terms of many things. But I think the, the challenge that we have now is like uh, everyone is doing the, their own thing. So looking at it, obviously, like I said, in 2012, we have the JAC that first introduced sustainability principle as part of their listing requirements. Then we are now seeing a lot of uh, sustainability banking principle introduced in a number of countries. When I was looking, I found Kenya have got, Nigeria have got, Ghana have got as well. I might have left some other country, but I couldn't really pick up other countries that they have. Chances is they will follow because obviously, you could see that the bigger market is really taking a leadership. Then obviously the adoption of PR principle, global compact and ILO as well, is something that is really coming strongly. Then the green finance, I wanted to say the green finance and I think I couldn't finish it. The green finance is something that is coming strongly with most of the, the countries in the region. We are starting to see, I've seen one that was introduced by Tanzania as well as one of the countries that I've never mentioned. So you can see that there are progress in terms of doing different things for different countries as well. The King Codes for Corporate Governance, which when you look at most of the country, Mauritius have, have got their own code of good corporate governance as well. The other region, country in the region are also adopting, but it also emanates from the King Code of Corporate Governance. Yes, it's something that works mainly for the listed, doesn't really work much for the smaller business or the unlisted market, unless if they are really at a developmental stage as well. The Paris Agreement, where we know that uh, 33 countries in Africa, 6% of the, the, the countries that have adopted the Paris Agreement comes from Africa. So we had 30, 33 in Africa. And with that, the only challenge that we still have in that, unfortunately, 
we don't even have a climate bill in most of these countries. So we don't really know what are we really planning in terms of uh, reaching those targets that have been set on, on Paris agreements. Because the, I think the, for me, the point of departure should be the bill that tells you how do you really deal with issues around climate change as well. Adoption of regulation 28 and 29 in Namibia 29 in South Africa 28 is something that will also where it forces pension funds to integrate ESG as well. Adoption of IFC performance standard is something that we are seeing. Well, IFC performance standard, obviously, like I said, we are adopting them from other regions. Our watch how we really want to see it when we have our own performance standard. That guide on how do you do business in Africa. And like I said, we are looking at the um, Africa trade probably to come up with things like that and also see if going forward they will be able to integrate ESG as well. Then looking at the trends in investing for impact in Africa and also looking at ESG, obviously there is a, let, let me use the next slide, but this one you will have access to it. Looking at this thing, obviously this one gives you a percentage and amount of money that have been put aside that really require company or assets that are really integrating ESG. Obviously you're looking at it from different aspects. You will look at it, the bottom one, you look at ESG integration, where obviously there's a lot of allocation and the color here, it shows where the money comes from as well. So you can start seeing that money that comes from outside comes with a condition. They are attached in terms of like, you can't just invest them as you wish. You need to look at issues around ESG as well. You can see at negative exclusion, obviously Europe is taking a lead but on ESG integration, US is taking it, like I said, they're starting to come into picture and they've put those requirements, even though they're volunteer on their side, when they invest in other regions, they really force you to, to, to consider ESG issues as well. Then you look at the whole person class, obviously that's uh, slowly reducing when it, and being integrated into ESG integration as well. So some of this money is being reduced because they have been consolidated under ESG integration. Then you look at sustainability investing assets in Africa as well. We only got the data for 27, 2017. And obviously the number for ESG is also very high. There is not really, I think once you, and it's, it's divided into like region, but also look at the money that has been allocated for assets that are, ESG integrated in terms of the assets as well. You can see that is 384 billion. And obviously the sustainability theme, impact and sustainability theme, it's 100. So ESG alone have been allocated 348 billion as well. So the other thing obviously is the trends, which I spoke about it. And these are the trends coming from other regions as well in terms of ESG, we have put in Australia and New Zealand, Japan, the only challenge that I have with this slide is like, we are not seeing Africa. And the reason is because maybe we are not imposing our sustainability. And even if our money circulates or our money goes somewhere else, or our resources go somewhere else, we are not imposing those things and they couldn't really classify us. And I think this is the narrative that we really need to change going forward as well. Then we look at the, some of the ESG trends. I think one thing that we, <clears throat> we thought is going to happen, yes, you would fall Africa post COVID recovery. And obviously where we are lagging behind or where we feel like people are not enforcing, I think post COVID there will be a need to force more. And obviously investors have started. We are expecting more from investors as well, but some, sometimes those who were lagging and kind of like allow us not to invest without enforcing ESG, obviously we are going to see that those things won't be there anymore. COVID has proven most of the companies that didn't really have strong SG couldn't survive as well because they were meeting the minimum requirement and couldn't really go beyond. So when, the, when, the, <clears throat> when you are achieving minimum requirements and something happened, it really make you tremble and suffer because there, there, there's something that tests your your, your test your strength. And then COVID has tested so many companies' strength 
company that only settled for safety. They didn't have a health policy, obviously struggle. Company that were not transparent enough, obviously struggle as well, because now people are asking for more transparency. They want to know your books before they even help you further. So there, there are a number of things that we could even highlight that uh, really make the company suffer as well. Then obviously the government stimulus is also going to be the driver developmental financial institution, the DFIs that uh, they've been asking, but I think they're going to ask for more now. I've seen at the beginning of COVID, there's been a number of companies that were asked, what's your approach, what's your plan in terms of uh, addressing this? Who's backing you? What governance are you putting in place? And company couldn't come up with anything. So I think that's something that is going to happen. Multinational development banks, that's something that uh, probably they've been lagging a little bit, but we are going to, we, are, we expect that they will have to push more in terms of getting more stuff around ESG as well. And I think also there will be an increase in willingness of project in Africa to adhere to ESG standard. Like we're not saying it was not there, it was there, but I think there will be, the, 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 we should up our game as well as in terms of ESG. And I think diving deeper, obviously we are looking at things that are driving more ESG, the renewable energy market. And this one, I think it's one thing that I always say, we probably are going to be caught off guard because most of the investors coming from Europe or from West, they are now trying to, to move away from coal. Are we really ready to move away from coal? And those are the things that we didn't really plan well. So we might run out of energy at some point because we probably didn't prepare well to move straight to renewable energy. The only country that I know that have done a lot of work is Kenya when it comes to renewable energy. Most other country, I think we're still, I might be missing others, but we're still, we're still looking at the coal and other non-sustainable mode of energy as well that we need to, we need to really look at those strategies. And I think that's, a, that's kind of like a very high level of in terms of where we are. I will really leave you guys to ask me questions and uh, then we can discuss. Wonderful. Um, so maybe maybe hungry. Um, let's let's stop sharing and then let's go for the okay. Q&A. Okay. Okay. Um, so everyone, thank you. First of all, hungry. Thank you so much for the insights of, about ESG in Africa. And um, to our audience, I hope your questions are ready. Um, we will quick start. We will quick start with with our um, Q and A's in, in, in a few. Um, so we do have we do have a question from Jason. So Jason is asking: We are getting a lot of investment and projects from Middle East and Asia. Any developments there that impact Africa on ESG? Okay, I think when we look at, uh, at Middle East and Asia, recently there was uh, one thing that was very interesting. We thought maybe they didn't really care much about ESG. I was surprised when I saw, I'm trying to think, I saw an RFP or an instruction, instruction to most of the banks that have been funded by it's a company in Middle East or a pension fund in Middle East, where they were instructing that they, they need to put their ESG strategies. So I think they are, they are feeling the pressure. They are starting to see the development. They are starting to see the value of ESG. And I think like a flag, ESG, it's a, it's a value add and a risk management strategy. So once you don't, you don't really do that, the thing is like certain things will come from nowhere and you won't even understand where they come from because you won't be managing them. So Middle East, they're starting to wake up to ESG as well. They're starting to require ESG to be part of their investment strategy. Asia, if you look at Japan, one of the biggest pension funds in Japan, obviously, when you listen to the CEO, how he speak about ESG, definitely you're not going to get money from them if you don't have a robust ESG strategy. 
you will single out countries. You will, you will have few countries that still don't know what is happening. But in general, when you look at the biggest investor in Asia, they are key drivers of ESG. You look at um, Indonesia as well. They, they had to wake up when they realized that their palm are being harvested without any sustainability and they're losing their palm forest as well. So they had to enforce some sustainability principles. That's why I was saying, if we don't enforce our sustainability principles to our mining, we are going to wake up one day and realize that we don't have any more minerals. So Asia, they are waking up to ESG. Middle East, they're also waking up to ESG. But also the other thing that is very critical, in, if you look at Singapore, Singapore, they've, they've got regulations that really enforce ESG as well. So I think the Cambodia as well, those are the countries that are lagging behind. There are countries that are lagging behind everywhere else. So, but you look at the region mainly, there are, there are a number of things. If you Google Asia, you will see a number of uh, investors that are starting to wake up into ESG as well. Okay, thank you. Jason, I hope this is helpful. Um, we have a question from Shivani. Shivani is asking, why do governance issues tend to affect share prices more than social and environmental issues? Interesting. Well, I think when you look at governance, governance is more of a principal issues. And, uh, and, 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 and I think she's very, social issues will affect the share price. Environmental issue will affect the share price. It just depends on where is it happening and how is it happening and what is the impact of it. And like I said, obviously the materiality comes into picture. But governance is the, is the foundation of the company. So obviously if the governance tremble, the company will tremble because the foundation will be trembling as well. Hence, the, the, you will see that if there's money laundering, if there's corruption, if there's um, change of directors as well, like uh, if they change like unexpectedly, you, you start suspecting that something might be happening in that company. People won't because you can't just wake up and find that three directors are resigning in one company. What is it that they know that we don't know? But I'll give you an example where the social issues and the environmental issues have affected the share price. Today, unfortunately, we are remembering Marikana for those who know. Marikana has affected the share price for that particular mine when it happened. When those people, for those who know Marikana, it's when miners in South Africa, I think almost 34 miners were killed in one night in one of the mines around the Rustin Beck. And the, the share price, the company struggled for quite some time. And the key thing was that the social labor plans that they've agreed with the community. For a long time, community waited until they couldn't wait anymore and they started reiterating. Unfortunately, 34 people died. And like I said, it's, 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 it's today. And the share price was down. You look at uh, BP when the, when the oil spill in the, in the sea, the, the share price was affected. It was an environmental issue. So it does, like I said, it depends on the materiality of things. It, it, it can be a, certain things we want to, if the company is fined for not reporting on something else, we might not end up knowing because the department doesn't disclose some of those information. So if the information is not disclosed, then the, the, the market won't know as well. The market will tremble for something that they know. Okay, okay, thank you. Shivani, I hope this helps. Um, let's take our next question. It comes from an anonymous attendee. Um, the person is asking, are there any continent-wide activities being coordinated, AU or otherwise, that are trying to coordinate one central ESG standard for Africa? Unfortunately, I'm not aware of. I don't want to say they're not there. I'm just not aware of. I've, um, I've been part of so many other things that have been happening in, in other regions as well or globally. Um, haven't heard of any standard coordination that are happening in Africa. And I think that's something that probably to be has to Yeah. And I, I'm hoping the, the Africa trade will be the key driver 
of it. Yeah, definitely. So we have another question from someone and the person is asking in her submission, she mentioned that Africa doesn't have many investors. So what is being done about this? You said Africa have what? Africa doesn't have many investors. So what is being done about, about the investor thing? I will disagree with that part. Okay. <laughs> I think we do have, I mean, we have investors and we have a, you will, you will, okay, let me give you a very simple example. We have banks. Okay. Banks are investors. Mm -hmm. We have insurance. They're investors. We have pension funds. We need to start asking, especially those who work for government or where, even for private company where you're contributing, contributing a pension, where is your pension being invested? Mm -hmm. Because if your pension is not invested where you are, then it's a challenge. So I don't think I will say we don't have many investors. I've worked with the investment and I know there are lots of investors. If you look at each and every company, if each and every country, they've got a government pension fund. They've got government finances that are being invested somewhere. Probably the question is like, where are they invested? And where are they investing? Maybe they're just sitting in the bank making on 32 days, days notice or smaller investment. And those are the things that we need. PIC was one of the, it's one of the largest investor in Africa. Doesn't mean they're the only one. There are other that I've come across when I was, mm -hmm. uh, this DBSA, this, there's a, uh, I, I, what is it? There's so many, I think <laughs> there's so many <laughs> that we just need to make sure that at least they, number one, they need to drive ESG. Number two, they need to invest where we can be able to, to access those monies as well. I see. Um, okay, we have a question from Anita. Anita is asking, ESG for big multinational is fine, but what about application of ESG in startups? I think the, the challenge that we have now, that's why I, when I started, I said, we are, we are taking things from other regions. IFC, when you look at it, it's very good. It could provide guidelines, but it's not a bubble. You just don't have to follow it from to the T. So what you do, you take the IFC performance standard, you take the CDC, you take whatever standard are out, the equator principles, you look at the size of the company and then you need to adapt it so that it fits. You are not, you, you, you are not going to find a, an SME and say to an SME, I want you to have a board with independent directors. It's not going to happen. They won't even afford to pay independent directors. But you can say, okay, I want you to have good governance principles and you define the good governance principles. I want you to have a board. On your board, don't just take your family. Take mm -hmm. other people in the market. There are lots of people that are willing to sit on. I'm just giving you an example. There are a lot of people in the in, in outside that will come and sit on the board, either for experience or for just doing it because they've really reached the self-actualization and they just want to give back to the community. But the problem that we have is like, Immediately when we look at IFC, we feel like they're just above. So one thing that we, we really have adopted with Equalitas and something that we've started is like set reasonable milestone for the size of mm -hmm. the company. Don't first day stay to the company. You need to have an ESG management system. When they can't even, they don't even have a smaller ESG policy. They don't even have a human resource policy. Look at what is material for that particular company start putting that so then you are you are you are making a sizable chunk for them to be able to achieve then you you, you keep on moving with them based on their growth as well so i think that's why when when you are a startup you feel like it's you are uh, i can't even do it it's too much it, you just need a guidance in terms of like what is it that you can put that is material for your business as your business grow you will be growing as well you will reach a point where 
when you exit, maybe you will be exiting to a listing or exiting to a private equity company. I see. Okay. Um, there's a question. Is ESG the new CSR? So for those who do not know about CSR, it's corporate social responsibility. Yes, go on. Uh, it, it, CSR is um, it's part of ESG, but it's okay. not a, it's not something material to ESG. <laughs> I see. Because when you look at, and I think the advantage is like I've worked at a CSR for quite some time, for almost five years. That that part is more trying to make an impact within the community where you either you can choose, you can be community where you are operating in, it can be community where you get your employee, it can be just community in general, or you choose a sector that suits you. So when we look at the social aspect of being, we are looking at issues that uh, we will look at CSI, but it's a smaller thing. It's not even like material. Are you really doing anything to your engagement? And then we also look at it and say, are you not using it to bribe your stakeholders so that you get other things? So it, it can be a good thing and a bad thing as well, because you might be using doing your CSI to bribe the community so that they don't raise issue of pollution that you are doing in the community. Or you are dumping things that are old in the name of a CSI as well. So those are the things that we normally look at it from the ESG. So when with ESG, you are diving deeper into what the business is doing and how does it really benefit? What value does it create? If we look at it, CSI and say, okay, it really help you build relationship with the community. It really help you develop the education or the health sector. Then it means that at least you are doing something sustainable. Wow, that's, that's nice. Okay, we have a question in two parts from an anonymous attendee. The person asked, any guidance, suggestions for organizations in Africa? What should we orient ourselves towards? A, standards wise, and B, are there any resources for us to start our ESG journey? Dummies, guide, or any sort, any, or some kind of canvas roadmaps that could help us get started. Yeah, the, like I said, there's a lot of there's a lot out there. But you, I mean, you if you go to CDC, they'll provide you with a toolkit. If you go to IFC, they'll provide you with guidance. If you go to um, European, why am the, the SASB as well will provide you with a lot of things. There are, there are a number of information out there that you could just take and you can't just plug in, that's the problem. You need to adapt it to your environment. You need to be able to know what is it because they give you a lot. So you just need to know for your company, what exactly do you want and how do you really bring things and understand that how do you really use them within there? Because once you bring them and you just bring them, it will be cut and paste and it won't have any for someone who understands ESG, you will read it and you're like saying, you are very broad. What is it that you want to cover? So there are, there are guidelines. You are not starting from zero. You have to start from somewhere else. But as a, as a continent as well, like I said, we currently don't have standard. And when you take the standard from Europe, you take the standard from wherever you're taking them, analyze them, interrogate them, make them suit your environment make them align with your context as well. Don't just take them and then put them and then you realize, because if most of the standard you realize that it doesn't give you guideline on how to assess the legislation. And like I said, for me, the legislation is a point of departure. You can meet all the standard if you don't meet your own country legislation, you might as well not have a business because if they decided to close you down, they'll close you down with all best in class in terms of the standard. Okay, okay. Um, John B is asking, regulation drives ESG integration in South Africa more than any other African markets. Yeah, such as Mauritius. What is the reason for this? 
I don't know if it's a true statement, whether it's a, yes, there are a number of regulations in South Africa. I think that's, yes. that's one thing that we need to, to take credit. When you look at labor, there's the regulation. When you look at environment, there's the regulation. When you look at, there are a number of regulations that you can pull them and learn from them. But um, I think it's our culture in terms of uh, we have got regulation and we want to continue from there. <laughs> but uh, in other region, what normally happen is like, uh, I don't know whether it's a, it's a reliance of the international standard, but then the problem is like, they are really set very high to a point where you find that they're not even working. So I, I, I wouldn't really say South Africa, it was deliberate. I think it just happened that because of the environment where we are, and there's a lot of rights, people have got a lot of rights. So when there's a lot of rights, you need to try and come up with regulation that protects everyone. Because with labor, you, if you don't have regulation, it means that people will always be at the CCMA, employers will always be paying the employees who are not pulling their weight because CCMA will be there or something. So it's, it's an advantage, yes, but uh, it doesn't mean that other country in the region can't learn from it. I don't know if I'm answering, I answered his question. Uh, you're on mute. Dictisha, you're, you're on mute. Okay. Okay, um, Anita is asking, can we talk about ESG in the energy sector? Not renewable energy, but energy from other sources. You can talk ESG anywhere, in, in the mining sector, in the energy sector, because when you look at it from the energy sector, it depends on exactly what you are, what kind of energy. If you are looking at it from mm -hmm. coal, then yes, you are talking about uh, the number of things that are not the right thing. So when you go there to do diligence and coal industry, you are just looking at it to say, did they really put practice in place to minimize the impact? I see. Because they, they is, there are practice in place to minimize the impact. So you just want to make sure if they're applying those standards. Renewable energy as well, it's not, it's not that they will get a clean ESG score there will still be issues that you can identify within the renewable energy that are ESG related and that will go into their corrective action plan as well. I don't know if, okay, you're back. <laughs> I think I think it's it's a uh, it's a network thing on my end, but anyway, let's continue. We have a few questions more. Um, quickly, we'll we'll get through them. We have a question from Nkuleku. I'm sorry if I didn't get the name right. So um, the person is asking: Is there any unified way or standardized method which can be used to measure? and benchmark ESG practices from different companies? No, unfortunately not. And uh, the, the challenge that we still have in the industry, and I will, I will really be honest with that, is the, because we, don't, we, it's not only Africa that doesn't have a standardization. There is no standardization when it comes to ESG. Most of you come from the finance industry. I always use an example to say, if you are auditing books in South Africa, you are auditing books in Nigeria, you are auditing books in the it's US, it's, it's different, but there's, principle, there's principles that you apply. Yes. You need to know the, the method that have been put in place and you might come with very close results. If you are doing evaluation, the number will be, because the, the method is, is kind of like written down, it's clear, everyone needs to follow. If you didn't follow this one, you have followed this one. With ESG, unfortunately, it's not like that. We are still struggling with standard. There, it's more, you'll find that uh, different uh, agents who do the, the scoring or the assessment have gone through the assessment or different people. I mean, my colleague and I can go through the same company and we'll come up with the different results because it's more, 
it's more, I think it's still more subjectivity. That's, that's one challenge that exists. And that's why maybe we are struggling to convince the finance people to say, we are part of your industry because they always ask you, where's the formula? And we don't really have that formula. And that's, that's where the challenge is. So it's one area that is still lagging behind when it comes to ESG. It's clear standard in terms of like, uh, how do you really measure things as well? Okay. Um, we have a question from someone asking, international investors are involved in the peak or top governance issues. What are we not doing to get it done to the core or local streams of Africa in terms of education, health, and small businesses? Uh, I'm, 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 I'm not getting the last part why, why okay. so the person yeah. is asking what are we not doing mm. in order to get it done you know to the core mm -hmm. or in, in, in local streams of Africa like to get it done in Africa in terms of education health and small businesses Gavin, and he's, she, he's talking he or she's talking about governance oh okay uh, i, I think, think so where, where i'm struggling is to connect if, if they can I, I don't know if you can allow them to ask the question no it, it wouldn't be possible like they, they me, only use okay let, let, let me let me answer the two the, the two questions separately i think it's correct international market is really for enforcing governance in terms of that we need to, to be transparent i think transparency is one of the things that they really wanted to to happen with most of our business. But the reason why they're doing that is because there's a perception out there that Africa is corrupt. Uh -huh. And, and, and the, the, the question is like, are we really demystifying that myth or that perception that we are corrupt when we do business? Are we the only one who's corrupt or it's just that the business industry is corrupt itself? So I think that's why there's a lot of enforcement around uh, corruption, or not corrupt governance, because where there's good governance, there's transparency, there's disclosure of information, then things becomes very public. And I think it's something that we need to, when we start resisting the disclosure and transparency, that's where that myth, we perpetuate that myth that we don't want to disclose because we are corrupt. We are hiding things that might have happened in our books or something. So I think that's why normally when you look at it from the ESG, it's more looking at it to say, how do we really make sure that things are transparent? Mm -hmm. And when we assess you, we'll be assessing you. That's why I'm saying when you are a, a small business, make sure that your board is diverse. Mm. I'm not looking at a board where it's your mom, it's your cousin, it's your uncle, it's your, yeah. and that's the company board. Yes, it's a family business, but what stops you to diversify your board and bring different skills? Because what we really want is skill set. We want experience, we want independence. The board should be independent. Let's not sit at a dinner table and be able to discuss business issues and all, of, all directors are sitting at that business table. At, at that uh, dinner table, then it means that the dinner meeting and the, everything is becomes one thing as well. Record keeping is one thing that we, they really want to see to say, how do you keep your records? Your minutes of the meeting, your discussion, is it something that is open and transparent or when you come, we come to do a due diligence, we ask for the minutes, they are not there. And that obviously is something that affects all industry. I think that's where they have the education the SME is coming in. It affects all the industries, the financial sectors as well, it's affected. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, someone is asking, how can ESG be integrated in NGOs or charity organization whose missions are to help conflict afflicted people or refugees? When, when you, I think when you look at ESG, right, you are looking at mainly the internal controls. You are looking at their processes. So mm -hmm. if, you talk, if you talk about an NGO, they need to have a governance. Okay. So obviously the G of the ESG will apply. You will look at governance. 
from an NGO point of view to say, yes, this is an NGO, how is it represented? Do we really have a voice from the community where you are servicing as well? Because then it, it, it's the governance aspect to say, you are not just doing things for them. They're also, they've got a seat around the table as well. You look at the S of that aspect, it's more looking at the, the treatment that those people are getting. Are you treating them like you, with respect? Okay. Are we, remember I spoke about data protection. Are you protecting their identity? Do you remember NGO, they love to flag pictures of their beneficiaries as if those people have no say. If you ask them, I don't think anyone will want it. their pictures to be just be moving around, displaying, I've received a pair of shoes, or I've received a, this and this and this. That, 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 that thing happened without even their consent. So that's where the S element comes in. The environment, you might find that it's not really, depending on the industry, especially the industry that they've mentioned, the environment might not be that much, unless if you are now moving into infrastructure development or starting to create housing for them, that's where the environmental element will come into picture. I don't know if, Dictisha? Okay. So I think that there's also <clears throat> One question that I'm seeing, which say, what do you think it will take the governments in Africa to take climate issue more serious? And I, I think that one is, um, it's, I mean, I, I, I don't understand why we're not taking it serious now, because it, it's already happening and we are seeing the effect of climate change. So it's, it's, it's also that thing where we just want things to come in a platter and we, or we just go to meetings, sign documents and come back and not, talk, not take it serious. In other area, you'll find that there are activist groups that push for things. And I think that, that movement in Africa, is also lagging behind. They're not really pushing hard for things to happen as well. So the climate movement, if it's there, is something that we really want to push and make sure that government take, make them accountable for what they've signed, especially when it comes to Paris Agreement. You are on mute again. Dick Tisha, you're on mute. Sorry, so sorry. Jason is asking, do you see IMF, World Bank, Development Banks, start using ESGs on country level investments? Please uh, repeat that question. Do you see IMF, World Bank, development banks start using ESGs on country level investments? They, they, they I think they are, but uh, I'm not sure if it's something that they're enforcing. And if they start enforcing, probably we will also start seeing a lot of development happening with those money that we get from IMF or wherever we're getting them. I don't see anything why they couldn't really enforce ESG at a country level, honestly. Okay. Maybe they do to those clients. Mm -hmm. um, there's one question. If okay. food vendors or restaurants start serving food in leaves instead of plastic takeaways, are they being ESG compliant as well? Okay. That's greenwashing, I think. We can't pick and choose one thing from, you need to look at things holistically. Uh -huh. <laughs> you, you can't just say because I'm, I'm not printing papers, I'm, I'm ESG compliant. You might be doing other things. So yes. when you look at that business, you're not going to look at it from one point. You look at the whole, the business across the, the board. Okay. Um, someone is asking how ESG addresses conflict minerals. Conflict minerals. Uh-huh. Myself, I don't know what's conflict minerals though. <laughs> I'm trying to think of how will we fit ESG within the conflict mineral. I don't know. And that one, let me admit, maybe because I'm, I'm missing the conflict minerals. Yeah, maybe we need some 
um, some more some more in the questions, you know. I guess um, if we're talking about uh, the whole issue around the diamonds and all fight that are happening. And if I have to think that way, probably it would be more, how do you apply your stakeholder engagement? That that probably will be the approach that you take to say, when you look at it from the stakeholder point of view, how do you really come up with an approach that try reach out or identify? For, for first thing, you will have to map the stakeholders. Who are the key people that are really interested mm -hmm. in those minerals? And then from that point, you will be able to say, okay, based on those, how do we really engage them before we even bring them into the table to discuss their concern? You, you come up with a strategy that will work and try to resolve that uh, that uh, that 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 issue. And and uh, I think that that for me will be the approach that I will have to say take it from the stakeholder engagement point of view. Because okay. the other stakeholder might be excluded, and that's the reason why it's causing conflict. Mm -hmm. Okay, one question from Lisa. Lisa is asking, what do you think it would take the governments in Africa to take climate issues more seriously? I think when you drop off, I try to answer that one. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But okay. I can see it on my, on my chat. <laughs> okay, 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 all right. So um, we have a question from, who is this? Okay, Im, Imrua. Yeah. And then person asking, how can ESG be integrated in NGOs, charity organization? Okay, we've answered this question in, yeah. in our, in our um, Q&A. So do we have more? Yes. Would you recommend using any of these? Economy for the common good, GRI, um, or B Corp as a guide and standard to meet our ESG reporting criteria and start out ESG journey? GRI is more impact. Okay. Economy, I, I this this other two probably I will have to look at them, but uh, I know GRI is mainly for impact. So exactly. for years, I think the key thing that I would drive obviously it will be the you can use guidelines from CDC, you can use guidelines from uh, IFC, the EB European. Business EBDR, I think, is something that you need to look at it. And um, SASB is also something that is also driving ESG materiality as well. So there are a few other things that uh, that really guide and will give you a very good view. OECD is also have got good approach when it comes to ESG as well. So there are a number of them, but I think uh, let me. Say I will look at these two that they put and see equator principles and other guidelines that they, they really look when it comes to ESG as well. The ILO, the, that's, that's something that provide good guidance. And World Bank Health and Safety Guidelines. Okay, wrapping, wrapping up. All right, we have a question from Anil asking the question, the corruption index in African countries are high. So can we still talk about applying ESG in all African companies? Yes. <laughs> no, okay. yes, definitely. Even, even though the, the corruption index is high, I don't think it really stopped company to change the, like I said, there's always an opportunity to change the narrative. Uh -huh. And it can start with the companies. If companies can start doing the right thing. I think the question also becomes to say, when they come to do that kind of assessment to come up with the index and this, the, 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 all the list of companies that they really want to exclude, what do they look? Do they look only at government or they also look at company? And company, like I said, they can change the narrative. It doesn't mean that because we're living in a country that is classified as corrupt, corrupt, mm -hmm. so you don't corrupt do as well. Yeah, you can, you can change that and say, I'm going to run my business in a game. And if, if but they said, if the buyer stop, the seller will also stop. 
Mm-hmm. So I think it's us sure. who can stop buying from those people that are really providing the the the, the corrupt the corrupt things. And I think someone has mentioned. Uh, I was saying EBRD, yes. And they've put the, the link for EBRD. Thank you, Jason, for, for doing that, yes. Mm. So you put the link and the people can get the link for EBRD there on the, on the chat room. So for okay. me, I think corruption, is, it doesn't mean that we need to be corrupt because we, we have been classified as corrupt. We have Chile asking, how does ESG address the issue of unfair labor pay practices such as unfair payments between different races or sexes. And also he, Chile is asking how can ESG be used to address issues such as approval of mining rights but communi- communities are against the opening of the mine. Okay, two different things. Yeah, it's two different things. But the, and, I mean, when you look at the first one in terms of the um, the employee and the employee pay. The reason why is something that we, we have noticed is a key thing, especially in, in South Africa is one of the area because of apartheid, other region as well where local and the expatriate are not paying the same amount as well. So how you do it when you get there, especially if you're doing a due diligence or you are, it's a company that you're monitoring, you need to ask. That's why we, prom- we preach transparency and disclosure. You ask for the remuneration. You want to see. You can you can just sample the position and say, "Can I have for this one?" Or you can just ask for say, "Can I have your payroll? Can I look at your payroll?" And then you start looking at it. You you don't only look at it. Normally, when in a listed company, you realize that you need to vote for executive remuneration. You need to vote for board remuneration. And what you normally benchmark it is just say, "Okay, fine. You look at the highest paid." you look at the lowest paid and look at the gap. Yes, we know they've got different, uh, they've got a var- different responsibility, but the gap should be reasonable. And you can come up with, there the, the, the have been a number of studies that have been done in terms of benchmarking mm-hmm. the size of the company versus the remuneration of the CEO and the remuneration of the, and the lowest you are not going for the cleaner, you are going for someone who's professional as well, or someone at the management level as well. Okay, we're taking one last question. And the, the, question the is last for... one, let me just answer the last one. Okay, the, sure. the, the, the mining thing where the person was asking in terms of the community as well. I think it was like, how do you really address the, the labor issue? No, sorry, the social issues within the mining community. Was it the question? Yes, yes. And it goes back to, to stakeholder. One thing that you, you we need to understand is like that social labor plans is it's a, it's a social license for the minds. As a community, we need to take it serious. We need to, because someone needs to sign it off. And normally people just sign it off without understanding. You can make the mind accountable for them coming back and report back to the community because it's a stakeholder. So it's part of their stakeholder engagement and you can require them to say, okay, fine, on an annual basis, come back and report to the community in terms of like, what are you doing? Where are we in terms of social labor plans? For listed company and in stock exchange that are really enforcing sustainability issues, they want those reports to be published. And that's the time where we can even question it if we find that there's a mere representation on what they're reporting on those, uh, those reports as well. The unlisted company, I think it's a pity that the disclosure, it's a volunteer things and it's hard for them sometimes to, unless if they've got an investor who force them to disclose. Okay, okay. Um, quickly, what are the main challenges to continued growth of sustainable investing? Well, I think they're talking growth in terms of the business. Mm, okay, okay. It's a, it's is something, this something, yes. Okay, say, so continue. No, I was saying this is something maybe we can also discuss in, in our upcoming webinars on ESG. Like it's, it's, it's long and needs <laughs> more. It's a very long, it's a long one. Yeah. But I think uh, one thing that we, we look at it, obviously ESG is not, um, it's not something that you will see the results overnight. 
you 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 mainly aim for long term things. And I always I always use a very I, I use a very simple example. It's like uh, if we say it, if you exercise, you will have a healthy life. If you exercise, sometimes you won't know <laughs> that you have prevented yourself from getting sick from many mm -hmm. diseases. Mm -hmm. But if you don't, you also sometimes so you you will only know when you notice that there are so many things that you have prevented yourself. By having employee that have got that sense of ownership, you will realize that you have saved yourself a lot when it comes to industrial action, when mm -hmm. it's come to work stoppage and all those things. And I think you only notice when the, the company next door are going through problems to realize that I think I've done a lot of investment to my employee. But in the long run, you will see it on your return as well. Because by saving on those things, there will be money into your account. By applying, yes, environmental issues as well. There are a lot of savings that you'll be able to see because you're not going to attract any liability, either from the local community or from the government or from other things. PNG is a long-term investment. And that, like you said, it's a, in terms of the return, it's a discussion that you need to, it's a long discussion that you need to happen, but there is a return of investment and it's estimated at 6.5 for companies that are doing proper ESG, that in the long run, they will be able to see the, the value of 6.5 in terms of realizing their value. That's the study that has been done for quite some time. Mm -hmm. Okay, last question for today. It's from Ishita. Ishita is asking, I believe ESG has to take the community also on board while making decisions. So is this possible in profit-making organizations? Yes, it depends on how you are looking at it well. And, and, and when you talk about decision, you are not asking them to come and have a seat, but for things that affect them, you will have to go and engage them. If you, if you are a profit company and you are selling something that community will use on a daily basis, you, they need to, to tell you what they want. Mm -hmm. They need to to, 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 because you, you, you are doing it for them. So you need to hear from them if it's something that they will really use. So that, that's part of engagement. That's why we talk about stakeholder engagement. We talk about stakeholder maybe. They will have their own forum where they will make the decision that will affect the decision that will be taken in the business. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's not different from NGO. If you want to ask the community what kind of services you want. It doesn't stop you to go to the community and say, we sell phones in this community, do a survey. That's a way that they participate. You sell soap, you sell lotion, you sell whatever you sell. You need feedback from your beneficiary. You use, need feedback from your customer. That's why you hear a lot of survey people calling you to say, oh, you are using this product. We have seen you go into this garage. That's the way in terms of the, how they consider the discussion. That's why we said it's very important to have a stakeholder engagement policy and map your stakeholders and the influence they have in your business. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, I think uh, okay, our questions, we've taken all our questions. Thank you everyone for your questions. Um, we will we will wrap up quickly. I think I think from the entire discussions um, today, I would believe that Africa has some of the fastest growing companies in the world. Okay, and every area of Africa has something to offer, whether it's natural resources or human capital. There are so many things in Africa, and I think um, even talent is exponential. A lot of talent. So maybe it's the system and institutions that do need support, especially, you know, when it comes to international investors and in, in the ESG area, right? So um, I hope uh, today's session was extremely um, fruitful. Um, we did have a, an insightful discussion. Um, thank you everybody for your questions and your time. There's something from Jason. Okay, that's directed to you, Manavela. I think it's on your chat. Okay, let me. 
I'm going to go to the chat. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of links. Okay, Jason, I hope you've enjoyed our webinar today. Oh, there was just answering. That was just answering oh, the okay. last question, not your okay. question. Yeah, okay. I was looking at it because I think he was confirming the 6.5 that I've mentioned, yeah. Okay, okay. Okay, um, so everyone, thank you very much. Thank you, Manavela. Thank you so much for today Thanks. and taking your time to answer all the questions. It was amazing. And thank you to our audience too for joining us. Um, we Today's uh, session actually is one of the first in our, uh, in our ESG and impact investing series. We are coming up with more webinars on, on various aspects when it comes to ESG and, and impact. So do join us to, to follow up on all the conversations we will be having around this topic. So thank you for today. Definitely thank you, Manavela. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. And any questions with regards to women in finance and investment networks as well, please do not hesitate. Do send us emails. You can reach us out on our website. There, there are so many guidelines there. Or emails. Do reach us out and we would um, hopefully get back to you as soon as possible. So thank you, everyone. Um, thank you again, Hungry. It was amazing Thanks. to have you on our platform. Um, so yeah. Until we, until we talk again. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Yes.